Recently at Iowa State, as well as Simpson and Grinnell, Dr. David Smith discussed some of the aspects of the drug problem. Dr. Smith is medical director of the Haight-Ashbury Medical Clinic and consultant on drug abuse for the Department of Psychiatry at San Francisco General Hospital. And rather than go down through the usual sort of listing of, of identification of the different drugs and some of the uh, factors involved, I'd like for you to discuss some of the things that oftentimes aren't talked about. At what point is the accurate drug information essential for our young people in their developmental stage? Well, I think the most important thing to understand is that any drug pattern is an interaction <coughs> between a chemical uh, personality and a social environment, and therefore when you're going to educate young people about drugs, you've really got to start uh, at a time before they start thinking about taking the chemicals or experiencing the social pressures that might lead them to, to use drugs. And I think that it should begin in, in elementary school uh, in the Bay Area. The decision to take drugs starts about the seventh grade. So obviously, if, if you're going to have a form of conceptual drug education that is meaningful, it has to occur before the seventh grade. But it really has to be not just you know, illegal drugs. It has to also discuss what the whole act of ingesting a foreign chemical in your body means, what taking aspirin means, what smoking cigarettes means, what taking penicillin is. In other words, it has to be a conceptual thing that emphasizes all aspects of drug taking so that <clears throat> it's relevant for the young person when he is actually placed in a situation in, in which he might be tempted. And most of the young people get started on experimentation with illegal drugs because of curiosity, peer group pressure, and if you haven't worked with your young person and helped him make decisions about how to resist these things, then uh, your drug education hasn't been successful. Well, if you have given inaccurate information, then this also adds to the the fun of experimenting because uh, then the results are different from what somebody told you they would be and so why believe anything they say? Does this happen? Well this is a uh, one of the big problems with drug education as it's currently formulated is that there's a great deal of misinformation and most of the material relates to specific drug facts and then <clears throat> school administrators in particular are very anxious to make certain things seem a lot worse than they really are, particularly in the area of marijuana. So they'll throw out some uh, information that's not true, but it's scary. <clears throat> and they don't think that this matters much, but if you've then had a very good drug education program and you've talked about amphetamine and barbiturates and heroin and the real dangers of these substances, and then at a later time the young person hears or finds out one way or another that what you said about marijuana was invalid, then the reaction is to reject everything you've said. And this is one of the biggest barriers to effective drug education, the fact that young people think that we're lying to them about everything. And then they always point out certain specific bits of misinformation as a way of documenting that all of it should be rejected. And I think that <clears throat> our biggest goal in drug education is to establish credibility. And when you're speaking of, of the, uh, the results of the drug intake and the things that it can do with, with the body, I suspect that many adults are not aware of the things that happen uh, and that uh, the diet pill doesn't just take off uh, the uh, take down the appetite and the weight, but that there are many other things that are involved and many serious consequences in the long run. Yes. All right, going on to something else that impressed me as uh, talking with you is the factor of the illegal drug market being extremely detrimental as far as again the young people because of the environment that, that 
they have to go through during their teenage and pre-teenage years in order to obtain the drug that many times they're going to be getting. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on this and, and the consequences? Of well, one of the biggest concerns of those of us that are in the treatment of young people is that although you, it's essential to have regulation of drugs and law enforcement to, a, in a, to control supply, particularly the more dangerous drugs such as heroin, barbiturates, amphetamine, um, LSD, uh, the criminalization of the drug user, in other words, treating him as a criminal, has produced, and particularly the young, many more serious consequences than the act that he's gone through. For example, any time you have a drug in large demand, then a delivery system will develop, even if you've made it illegal. We have a very naive <clears throat> feeling in the United States that if we just made a drug illegal, then it'll go away. And we should have learned that this doesn't work with prohibition, for example. That with prohibition, all we did w with prohibition was to lose control of the distribution of that drug and a huge black market developed to supply the drug. Now, there is a huge black market in marijuana. The young person that wants to buy marijuana has to enter into this illegal drug scene. He is exposed to a variety of other influences and temptations and particularly if he smokes marijuana and finds out that it didn't lead to uh, mania and all these other horrible things that he found out about uh, in the drug education program at school then he's liable to say well they must have been lying to me about these other agents and certainly they're readily available uh, and then he goes on and experiments with these other things in the Bay Area for example if you legalized marijuana, you would decrease its availability, decrease its availability to minors. Because it's easier for a minor to get pot than it is booze, because there's such a huge marijuana black market. Now, our biggest concerns are not with adult marijuana use, but with minor marijuana use. We don't want young people in the formative stages of their adolescent maturation to be taking any drugs, not marijuana, not pills, not booze, not anything. And it's, of course, very difficult to try to get them through these crucial stages of adolescent maturation without them getting involved with drugs. But we're certainly not decreasing the availability, at least in the big city areas, of marijuana by making it illegal. In fact, by making a a drug that has a billion dollar market in the United States illegal. We're increasing its attractiveness by making it a forbidden fruit. We're increasing and in supporting uh, this very well organized black market distribution system and we're exposing them to uh, a system that we want to keep them out of. Well, uh, exposing them to uh, <coughs> a greater availability as well as to an environment that is not conducive to uh, the full development uh, as they should be developing. Right. One last thing. Do you have available a list of literature that would be on the level that uh, parents would be able to get good information? Well, the place to write for that type of information is the National Institute of Mental Health and their drug abuse section. We have literature at our clinic uh, that's a little bit more sophisticated, but I think you can get the simple literature for for parents um, and for youth in large quantity from the National Institute of Mental Health and they, and they distribute it for free. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our guest has been Dr. David Smith. He is medical director of Haight-Ashbury Medical Clinic and consultant on drug abuse for the Department of Psychiatry at San Francisco General Hospital. And thank you very, very thank much you. for taking the time.